Hello. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you guys can see and hear me all right. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Gabby. I'm going to be telling us a little bit about the Gaviota Coast and our awesome kelp forest that we have here. So to get started, I'm going to show you guys the beach that I'm at. Usually I'm at Gaviota State Beach, but it got a little, you know, muddy with the storm. So I'm here at Refugio. So I'll show you our park here. I'm up here at our education center. And you can see the trains passing by. And I'm here, Gaviota Coast. I'll show you a map of where I'm at at the moment. Usually I'd be on the beach, but with our high tides right now, there's not much beach for me to stand on. So I'm standing up here, a little sheltered from the cold. All right. So let me share with you a map of where I'm at. All right. So like I said, I'm kind of close to Santa Barbara. You can see I'm right where that red dot is, I'm about like a two, two and a half hour drive north of Los Angeles. Um, and I am right across from the Channel Islands. So it's kind of foggy today, but usually there's these giant floating rocks out in the ocean, and those are our Channel Islands. And I am on a stretch of coastline called the Gaviota Coast. Santa Barbara to Point Sal, 70 miles. And it's one of the last undeveloped stretches of coast in Southern California. And that means if I wanted to go to the grocery store, I would have to go about 20 minutes north or 20 minutes south to get to the closest town grocery store, stuff like that. So you can see here, we're gonna be talking a bit about our MPAs. And in this map, I am right here, close to the Cash Tai MPA. Um, that we've got a lot of marine protected areas on this stretch of the coast, um, especially at our Channel Islands that are just right across the way. Um, a lot of red is on this map and that means marine reserves, but where I'm at by Cash Tai is blue, a marine conservation area. And a marine conservation area is still an MPA, it's still a marine protected area, but it's a little bit more lenient. We still do have rules though, about what you can and cannot take from this marine protected area. But on the red, a lot of that is at our Channel Islands that are, those uh, indicate marine reserves. And those are areas that you absolutely cannot take from whatsoever. Um, and you see Campus Point by UCSB is purple. So it's a mixture of the two. And our MPAs are super important to us here. We're gonna talk a little bit more about them in a bit. All right. But the reason we're here today is to talk about kelp. Now I love kelp, it's one of my favorite things and one of my favorite things to talk about. And there's a whole world underneath the surface and I'm super excited to share with you guys about this world. Um, and you can see uh, a lot of times we'll see this the surface of kelp or we'll see it like this on our beaches. So if you guys have ever been to the beach, you can maybe raise your hands in your classrooms if you've ever been to the beach and seen it on the, all the kelp on the sand and it's kind of stinky and there's bugs jumping around. And it's, it's kind of gross, but it's actually super important that we have our kelp on our shores. This is a natural beach here at Refugio. So we leave that kelp there and it actually helps our shorebirds. Our shorebirds are eating all of that, uh, all those bugs that are living in the kelp. So it's super important. Um, another reason why I love kelp. And we can also see that kelp is super important for our atmosphere. So kelp is a photosynthetic um, protist. It's not technically a plant. It's a little too simple to be a plant. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but you can see um, that kelp helps with our carbon dioxide emissions. So kelp will take in CO2, give us oxygen. And then when it floats out to sea, when it's you know ripped out from the um, bottom, the rocky substrates that it lands on, it will then sink out into the bottom of the ocean and it will still have all that CO2 within it. So it's sequestering our carbon and sequestering is just a fancy word for it. it's keeping it down. It's, you know, storing it away um, where we don't have to worry about our CO2. So another reason why we love our kelp, kelp actually um, has one to 10 billion uh, CO2 intakes per year. So um, one to 10 billion tons of CO2 um, gas that it can take in per year. And that's more than any like land um, or soil um, terrestrial life can. Um, the ocean's really capable of providing us with a lot of oxygen. 
every second breath we take, we can contribute to the ocean because it gives us half of our oxygen from all of this photosynthetic material like kelp. All right, and another fun thing about kelp is that we use kelp every day. So hopefully we all brushed our teeth this morning. And if we did, we utilized kelp. Kelp is in toothpaste. So if you guys brushed your teeth this morning, you were brushing your teeth with a little bit of tooth, a little bit of kelp. So we can see right here um, that we utilize kelp through like our sushis, our salads, our sundaes, all of that stuff has some pieces of kelp in it called carrageenan, which helps emulsify our foods and our products like that that we use every day. And that's because when you feel kelp, it's kind of slippery, it's kind of slimy, and that helps hold some food stuff together. And so recently, there's been a lot of kelp farming, um, not in our MPAs, that's not allowed, but um, in some other parts of our oceans, we have kelp farming. And you can see here that it's on a long string. And our kelp farming helps us with our CO2 emissions, of course. It helps us with you know, profiting from um, selling our kelp. And it also is used to um, make a really good fertilizer. And it doesn't require fertilizer for it to grow, but we can take less leftover kelp to help with our agricultural. So another reason kelp super, super cool. All right. But I wanna show you guys what that underwater world looks like. So I'm gonna show you a video and we're gonna look at this video. It's just about a minute long. And I want us to experience what it's like um, swimming, diving and kelp. So here is a video, we'll just watch it for a minute. And you can imagine what it's like for kelp under the water. You can notice some things that's happening to this kelp. Maybe you're noticing how it's moving. It's pretty cool. You can see all those fish swimming around. And you can see that rocky structure that all that kelp is holding on to. And you guys can notice that it sways, right? And um, I gotta say, when I go scuba diving, when I'm not at work, I go scuba diving sometimes for fun. And this underwater waves is called surge. And it's pretty strong sometimes. And this kelp is able to withstand that because it has specific, um, you know, anatomy, a structure to it that's helping it. So I wanna share with you guys some of the cool anatomy of kelp. So this looks kind of weird, right? Kind of looks like roots. And it is the root-like structure of kelp called hold fast. And I love that it's called hold fast because in that video you can see it kind of has to hold on fast when it is in that surge. And so the hold fast is holding onto rocks. And we can see here in this picture about how that hold fast is right here on the bottom. It'll hold onto a rock. And then we will have the other part of our kelp, such as stipe, it's kind of like a stem. And that is going to, you know, bring it up towards the surface. So the whole fast is connected to the rock at the bottom. And then this stipe is what's giving it its length. And then, you know, it's still kind of heavy. It's definitely heavier than the water. And the one thing that helps it float up are these gas bladders. These are called pneumatocysts. And these pneumatocysts, they're kind of fun to pop. Um, I always see people at the beach here popping these when they're on the shore. And they're filled with a mixture of CO2 and oxygen. And that's just helping lift the kelp up towards the surface. And when that kelp is at the surface, it'll have these blades, kind of like leaves on plants that are gonna lay on the surface of the water. And when it does that, that's where they're gonna be photosynthesizing. So a fun fact about our kelp here, the giant kelp, Macrocystis periphera, is that it can grow two feet per day, up to 150 feet. And I've done the math, so I'm 23 years old, meaning I am 8,600 days, 8,600 days. And if I could grow two feet per day, I would be 17,500 feet. And if I was 17,500 feet, I would be roughly about as tall as Mount Denali in Alaska. So this would be me if I was kelp. I would be super, super tall, but I'm not as cool as kelp, so I'm not that tall. But imagine if we were like kelp, growing two feet a day, pretty amazing stuff. 
But that's our, you know, famous macrocystis porphyra that can grow that big. Some of our other kelp cannot grow super big. Um, and we have different types of kelp. So it gets a little bit complicated when we talk about our kelp. Um, but the one thing we should know is that it's algae. It's just, um, you know, multicellular um, organisms called protists, not plants, just because they're not that complex. Um, the only complex thing about them is that there's three different types of algae. There's red algae, there's green algae, and there's brown algae. And so this right here is red algae. This is usually where we get the carrageenan from. This is usually the type of algae that we're going to be making toothpaste out of. Um, and the one I have right here is like red ogo. And I'll show you a picture of that one here. It usually has a super bright red hue to it, which is beautiful. And another red algae is this. This is um, red coralline algae. Kind of looks like coral and it kind of acts like coral. So what I have right here is bleached out coralline algae because it uh, is no longer alive. So it turns this white color. And so that there is our red algae. Another type of algae we have, another type of kelp is our green kelp. And that's like our sea lettuce. This looks like something that would be like on a Krabby Patty. It looks exactly like lettuce, right? So it's really interesting stuff. And this stuff doesn't get too big and it stays towards, um, you know, kind of deep, not super deep um, in the ocean, right? Because kelp still needs light to live. And the deeper you go in the ocean, the darker it gets. So it's still in our photic zone, our light zone in the ocean. Now, of course, we also have our brown algae, my favorite algae, like this guy right here. You can see the lighter, you know, kind of greenish hue. It's still brown algae, but the ones with the long blades, like this stuff right here, that stuff is our giant kelp. But this stuff here that looks all fuzzy, that is our feather boa. And so our feather boa um, grows off our, our coast right here. And, you know, we can assume why it's called feather boa. It looks like a fuzzy feather boa you'd wear. And this stuff's super fun. It looks super soft. Another type of brown algae that I love that we don't really have on this coast. It's a little too warm, but I still like to talk about it is our like elk horn kelp, um, bull kelp. It has one big nematocyst. You can see that that little bulb right there, that's its nematocyst. So that's what's holding it in the water, holding it up tall. And it's like that big. And then the blades are like that big. So this stuff is huge. And then of course, our famous, amazing giant kelp. This is the stuff that grows two feet per day. This stuff is amazing. And it was the stuff I showed you um, you know, we didn't have our blades attached to it. It was kind of been on the, you know, sand for a little too long. The blades weren't there anymore, but you can see that usually these long blades are connected to it. So this stuff is the coolest. And, um, you know, kelp forests are all around the world, uh, but some of our beaches look different, right? Like my beach right here looks different than a beach in the Caribbean, right? So it's not super bright blue waters, it's a little darker. And that's because I have a lot of nutrients in these waters. So whenever we see the ocean looks a little icky, it looks a little, you know, brown, it's usually a good thing because that means that we have our nutrients mixing in the water. And then what loves nutrients? Kelp, our fish that live in our kelp forests, our plankton, all that important stuff. And so you can see here where I'm at, which is right about here, I am surrounded by different types of currents, water that moves in our ocean. You can see red, those arrows that are kind of going like this. Those red arrows are warmer California countercurrents. And then I have some colder water that comes up from Northern California and it passes by us right here. And we get that mixing and that helps our nutrients from depth, all of that stuff come right up. Another thing that's super interesting, you can tell right now, probably by my hair, is that it's windy here. And wind is an important factor for kelp, believe it or not. The air is an important factor. Because when we have this wind, this air moving down our coastline, we have um, our water getting pushed further out to sea. And then that needs to be replaced by other water that comes up from depth. And that's how our upwelling works. 
And with that upwelling, like I said, all that yummy nutrients comes up to surface and our kelp forests love it. And then if our kelp forest loves it, then our other animals are gonna love it because our kelp forests um, here are home to thousands of species of fish. They use it for a nursery, they'll use it for a hunting ground, they'll use it to be their home, they'll use it to be their food source, all those super cool things, right? So our kelp forests are phenomenal. They also help us with our storms. So we got hit by a pretty bad storm. And I think we could have been hit harder if we didn't have our kelp forests. They kind of give us a cushion. They take the impact of some of those waves and they're able to you know, dissipate that damage. So without kelp forests, we would be having our, ocean, our coastlines eroded at a higher rate. So our kelp forests are helping us out with that. And so what I wanna show you guys is another video that we took here off the coast of Refugio. And in this video, you will see our state fish and you will also see some other cool animals. So you can see here, this is one of our divers, one of our, one of our lifeguards that are on our dive team. See a cool fish. This is our state fish, the Garibaldi. This is probably from the kelp forest. There's a lot of hustle and bustle. There's these cool Garibaldi. And you can also see, I think we're going to zoom in out in a second, is this other, you know, invertebrates, animals without a backbone like this, Spanish shawl nudibranch. Colorful things down here in the kelp forest, some things that blend in a bit more. We have, you know, hunting going on in our kelp forest. We have bottom dwelling. We have everything happening in our kelp forest. It's very active environment. And so our kelp forests definitely do land in our MPAs, right? And we found that there are some species that are doing phenomenal based off of where MPAs were located. And so one of the animals that I think of when I think of MPA is I think of this guy. So you guys can see in your classroom, have you ever seen this shell before? It's super pretty. It's got like an iridescent inside, it's kind of rainbowy. So this is actually a sea snail. This animal is our abalone. And abalone are very near and dear to us on the Gaviota coast. Um, we found out in the late 90s in California, they found out that these abalones, their population was declining. And that was from overfishing. People were just taking too many abalone and their population was diminishing. They were becoming endangered. They were almost extinct. And so with MPAs, with protecting an entire area, we were able to see these guys start to make a comeback. They're starting to bounce back. And so our abalone are, you know, a very good story to tell when we talk about our MPAs and about their importance. So not only are they a food source for people, they are also play a cultural importance. So our Chumash tribe that lived here and what our MPA is named after, Cash Tai, they relied on abalone to give them source of food, but also for the shell. The shell plays a role in their ceremonies. It's used as a bowl. Um, and so we wanna make sure we protect that natural resource that is abalone, but also the cultural importance of the sea snail. And you can see that this is what they look like underwater. I've been scuba diving and I think that I've probably swam past these guys before. They blend in, right? They're kind of camouflaged. They're covered in algae, which is kind of funny, kind of ironic because that is what they love to consume, right? They're algae eaters. They actually eat kelp. And you can see here, they've got their feeding tentacles. They're feeling around for that giant algae. And they also have this adorable face. So this is what an abalone's face looks like. You can see they've got those cool eyes. They've got those feeding tentacles. And they've got a radula. They've got a mouth in the center of them with two sharp teeth that help them feed at algae, feed at kelp. And so this animal is important to us. Um, it eats our kelp but we don't mind, we wanna see these abalone come back. Now there's one animal that, you know, is not everyone's favorite animal, and that is this purple spiky guy. Now this guy is kind of the villain in our kelp forest, plays an important role. He's food for a lot of our major predators there, um, but he's also eaten at our kelp. 
And the thing with sea urchins is they eat at our kelp really well. So our kelp forests typically, you know, are covered in, I mean, kelp, right? That's what it's all about. And so you can see here is what our normal kelp forests look like. And when these guys come in the picture and their massive numbers that they have, they will create something called a sea urchin barren. Now what's missing from this picture? The kelp, there's no kelp left. They ate all the kelp away. And that's why it's super important that we have some predators of these sea urchins. Now, one of those predators that gets our kelp forests happy and healthy is this guy, our sea otters. So our sea otters love to eat these sea urchins. Those spikes don't bother them one bit. They will just chew right through it and they'll eat many of them at a time. And you can see here um, that with sea otters, we have healthy, you know, abundant kelp forests, but without them, we will have sea urchin barrens. Now, I love sea otters. I think they're the coolest, but I don't see them here on my coast. You know, they were over hunted. They have the densest fur of any mammal and that was sought after by hunters. And so we don't have them here. We haven't had them here for like a hundred years or more. Um, so we have to have another animal step up, right? We still have a lot of sea otters. They're just further north. But here, instead of sea otters, we've got this one fish, this one beautiful fish called the California sheephead. Look at that smile. It's got those pearly whites. He must go to the orchidontist. <laughs> So you can see this guy's super cool, right? Our sheephead, um, they play that role of, you know, sea urchin eater. We really need them to be eating all those sea urchins so that we're not having too many of them, right? We know what happens when we have too many sea urchins, you know, kelp forests, which means we would have no home for our sheephead and for our abalone and for all of these fish and, you know, invertebrates and mammals that rely on kelp. And you can see here, this is what the male sheephead looks like. He's got that red stripe on him. He's got that big forehead and chin and that beautiful smile. And you can see here, this is what the female sheephead looks like. They look very different. Um, they're just super cool creatures too. We love to see these animals, um, especially when we scuba dive and stuff like that, right? So um, I keep talking about how I scuba dive and you know, kelp forests are a place that divers love to go. Um, our Channel Islands have been called the Galapagos of North America. There's just so much to see there. So people will travel far to just go diving in kelp forests. There's so much to see. And so I, what I want to share with you guys is a video of me scuba diving in a kelp forest. So this video is pretty awesome. I love this animal that I'm about to show you that I saw diving. When I'm in my free time, I like to go volunteer and help out with these animals, right? They kind of are susceptible to um, malnourishment or plastic entanglement. And this is me with a California sea lion. So there's amazing, you know, interactions that people have in kelp forests, such as seeing this California sea lion, right? It's just a wonderful world that's down there. And it's so cool. And seeing these guys underwater is just absolutely amazing. I mean, we see them in zoos or we'll see them on the shore and just seeing them swim super fast underwater. They swim at speeds of 25 miles per hour, which is crazy. I can only swim at like two miles per hour, right? These guys can swim fast and we can see them all interact with each other. They're super playful. They're like the coolest. You can see here they are very important members of our kelp forest. They feed on octopus, they feed on fish like mackerel. Um, they'll feed on um, the abalone if the abalone is able to be pried off the rocks. These animals are pretty awesome, right? So we're able to see some cool, cool species down there in our kelp forest. And so I told you how scuba diving is important for our kelp forest. Another thing that's important is fishing in our kelp forest. As long as it's not a marine reserve, a red area, remember how I showed you that map, then we are able to fish. Um, and of course, after following other guidelines, if it's a marine conservation area. 
And we still do have lots of rules for fishing. One animal I think of when I think of rules, when I think of fishing rules, is this guy. Has anyone seen this animal before? Kind of looks like, kind of scary. Kind of scary looking, right? Got all those legs. You can see here, this is a California spiny lobster. And our California spiny lobsters have um, an importance here, especially at Refugio State Beach. On our kelp forest, people love to go fishing for lobster, but we can only go fishing for lobster from October to March. That's when their season is open. On the other months of the year, we have to let them, you know, molt, get bigger, with allow them to reproduce, but they'll allow for their population numbers to you know, be happy before we're able to take any of them. And even when you go hunting for lobster, you have to have a lot of things. You have to have your ocean fishing license. You have to have your lobster report card and you have to bring a little ruler with you because these animals have to be a certain size before you can take them. And so you have to measure behind their eyes to the top of their tail, their carapace. And if that isn't the correct size, um, I think it's about three and a quarter inch, you cannot take them. You have to leave them there and they'll hide back in their hole. Maybe get them next season, but if they're too small, you're not allowed to take them. I remember how I said that lobster report card? Well, we're not grading them on their ability to do math and science. We are writing down the quantity of lobsters that we catch from a specific area. And we're handing that to our biologists with uh, Fish and Wildlife so that they're able to quantify and understand how the populations of our lobsters are in. And you can see here, these lobsters can get huge. This is probably like an 18 pound lobster. It's pretty big. And I like to show this picture because sometimes people ask me, why is it called a spiny lobster? Well, you can see on his back, he's got some spines there. And you see on his tail, those sharp, sharp kind of like hooks almost, those are his spines too. And so this is our California spiny lobster, um, but just really big size. Usually when I've seen them, they're this small. And so we leave them, um, you know, so they can grow a bit bigger. These animals are amazing. Our lobsters are super important to us on our coast. All right. So we talked a bit about our abalone um, and our sea urchins and how they eat kelp, but that's okay, but not too much, right? And then we talked about our predators in the kelp forest. We talked about our you know, sheephead and our sea otters and their importance, right? And then we talked about fishing importance like lobsters and all that stuff. And now, I had said earlier that kelp forests are a nursery for some animals and especially a nursery for sharks. So some sharks have these things, it's called a mermaid purse and like this guy. So you can see here, this is a mermaid purse. It's got some barnacles on it. We found this here at the beach and this one is also a mermaid purse. This is a horn sharks mermaid purse. This one's a little fancier. Like if mermaid purse had brands, this would be like the Louis Vuitton of mermaid purses. And this one um, is from a different species of sharks, right? This one's just kind of fancy. It's from a horned shark. And this one is from a swell shark. And so we can see here, I'll show you a picture of our shark. So this is what it looks like when it's underwater. And they are attached to kelp. So kelp's important because it's holding on to these baby sharks. So our baby sharks do, 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 are under the water and they are, you know, living in this um, egg cart or the, you know, our uh, egg case, our shark egg case. And so our shark will lay it, uh, wrap it around some kelp, and then she'll just move on with her day. Uh, she'll swim away and this shark is going to develop on its own and it'll feed off a yolk sac that its mom left, kind of like it packed a lunchbox, right? So it's gonna be feeding off of that until it's big enough to come out the other side of the case. So you can see here on this guy, here I can show you a bit better here, but there's an opening. So this shark left through here and this one, the opening is a little bit harder to see, but it'll leave out the other side and leave this casing behind. So sometimes we'll find them wash up on our beach here. And sometimes we'll find it wash up with the kelp still attached to it, right? So it's pretty amazing. These mermaid purses are a sight to see. And you can see here, this is a horn shark 
coming out of the um, kind of spiral like egg case. And the other egg case is a little bit more smooth looking is for an animal like a swell shark, which these guys are pretty cool too. They're kind of similar to our horn sharks, right? And that's about like 43% of sharks and rays will lay eggs, whereas the rest of them will just have live horn um, animals. And they'll lay about every 10 to 14 days with about you know just one or two eggs and one pup per egg case. So these guys are pretty cool. And our horn sharks that we have here off of our coast are amazing creatures. They're pretty docile. I know when we think of sharks, we usually think of great white sharks, which we definitely do have those off of our coast here. But our horn sharks, like this guy here, um, they're kind of smaller. They're about five and a half feet tall, which I'm five three, so they're just a little bit taller than me. And you can see they're bottom dwellers, right? They're flat on one side. You can see here his gills are moving. He's just hanging out, chilling at the bottom of the ocean. And you know, he doesn't really just moves along the bottom, right? Not a big fan of being on camera. So that is our horn shark that we have off of our coast here. So, you know, we talked about all of our animals. We talked about our marine protected areas and it's super important that we protect our um, kelp forests and especially for resilience of our ocean. So we saw that big storm um, and we saw that it impacted our oceans, right? We had some things like runoff, we had um, our creeks flow into our ocean um, with a lot of water coming in. And with that, there's a lot of plastic and a lot of trash, a lot of agricultural runoff, like pesticides. And that can really harm our ocean. Our ocean is very fragile and we need to treat it as such. And when we have these MPAs, when they're super strong areas, that means they're going to be able to bounce back from things such as, you know, storms, um, you know, ocean temperatures rising ocean acidification, all of that stuff. We wanna make sure we give the ocean the tools and the healthy environment so that it can bounce back. And so, like I said, plastic is a big thing that happens here in the ocean. Usually what we think of when we think of problems in the ocean. And plastic is a bummer to find here on our beach. Um, and so I would like to ask you all to pick up three for the sea. And that's three pieces of trash left that can end up on our um, in our ocean, right? So take three for the sea, three less pieces of trash that can end up in our ocean. Because think about it, a water bottle or maybe a um, piece of sand castle, so I usually find those here at the beach, those take a long time to break down. It'll take 400 years for a piece of plastic to degrade, to break down into nothing. And that entire time, it'll break down into teeny tiny pieces of plastic called microplastics. And those microplastics are a big bummer because if I was a little fish in the ocean and I saw a tiny floating piece of something, I'd probably think it maybe it's algae, maybe it's something I can eat, but it would give me no nutritional value, right? It would just stay in my stomach. And then what eats fish in the ocean? Other fish, sharks, um, our sea lions, all of those things are going to eat fish. And we also eat fish. So we want to make sure we reduce the amount of plastic that can end up hurting, you know, every animal in the food web. So like I said, three for the sea. We can also reduce the amount of plastic we use. We can also um, recycle plastic that we have. Um, and I always you know, reuse water bottles. So I have access to clean water. I'm able to fill this thing up like three times a day. And then I'm able to um, reduce the amount of plastic that I'm inputting into the environment. We can also reduce our carbon emissions stuff like that, so that we're able to um, you know, help the ocean out. Um, it's pulling a lot of weight with our carbon emissions. So we wanna make sure we reduce when we can, stuff like that. All right, so I think I'm gonna leave a little bit of time for our q and A. You guys wanna throw in some questions for me here at the end? All right, it seems like we've got some. Do fish eat kelp? So it depends on the type of fish. Um, for fish, smaller fish will probably feed on some algae, um, but we do have some other types of animals that feed on kelp, like that abalone, that sea urchin. And of course, we also have our famous 
kelp crabs. So I'll show you a picture of our kelp crab. When I think of animals that feed on kelp, I usually kind of think of this guy too, right? He's our kelp crab. He lives in the kelp and feeds on kelp. So imagine being so hungry, you can eat your living room. That's what this guy's life's about. He lives in it and eats it. All right, another question? Yeah, um, so um, this is Black Lives Matter. Can you see close to the screen and all the pieces? Can you give me this point? What's the title? Um, what needs to go in this direction? It seems so exciting. It seems so happy. Oh, cool. So um, the question was, what schooling and qualifications do I need for my job for me to get to this point? And what's my title? And what made you go in this direction? So um, I actually have my bachelor's of science degree in aquatic biology, but I didn't need my four year degree to do this job. Um, but I went to school at the same time of doing this job. I just graduated. Um, and so uh, with that, I hope to expand in my career with aquatic biology. But my title is um, interpreter. So I'm interpreting nature. I'm kind of a nature ranger is what we kind of call ourselves. Um, yeah, I love this job. This job is super fun. What is a kelp's lifespan and why does it grow so much? So they can grow up to 150 feet, um, two feet per day for giant kelp. It depends on the ocean conditions. And that's gonna change from season to season. Um, from ocean mixing seasons, which is usually about fall and spring, to um, you know, kind of slower seasons like summer and winter, uh, we kind of see less growth. Um, kelp can live for a long time, but it will reach a maximum. And it does finish its life cycle maybe when it's ripped out from the bottom of the ocean. It's a natural process. Um, it depends on each kelp species. That's a good question. What is my favorite sea animal? I think probably that sea lion, especially having um, you know, an interaction with that sea lion. It really is an amazing uh, creature to see um, and have a chance to see it. I've also seen um, a swell shark before. Those animals are pretty cool. I've seen those at night. It's pretty amazing. Um, and then about the shark eats, um, do the baby sharks eat for the most part ever? And do some of those um, sharks don't fully develop? Okay, so the question was, do the um, baby sharks, um, are they, you know, stay with their mom? Their mom will lay the egg. Um, so this egg will either be wrapped around the kelp or wrapped around the kelp and kind of tucked into a corner and she'll move on. A lot of animals in the ocean don't stay with their moms for too long, um, but she might be nearby. Um, and uh, what was the other part of this question? Oh, and then development of these eggs. So the embryo inside and the yolk sac, um, it depends on you know the protection with the other kelp in that forest. Um, but typically they'll completely develop and then just push their way out. Tallest and, Tallest and oldest kelp. That's probably the giant kelp I wanna say, um, could be the oldest living kelp. Though remember that weird tall um, bull kelp, that elkhorn kelp, that might be one of the tallest kelps as well. Oh, is there any plans to reintroduce sea otters to our area? So none so far. I think they might have tried to do that. Um, yeah, so they're working their way down. They're very site faithful. So wherever this sea otter is born, they're going to try to spend their whole lives there. They're not going to, you know, move past um, a specific area. So we're kind of trying to introduce them slowly back down the area, um, but for specific things. Oh yeah, part of this time we have a cool sea otter resource that we can send out so you guys can learn a bit more about that. But I would love to have sea otters be here all the time. They are the coolest. Oh, how long would it take for a piece, like a water bottle um, to disintegrate if it takes 400 years for a piece of plastic to? Well, the process of plastic um, degradation in the ocean is gonna be at first you know, baking in the sun and degrading into tiny pieces of plastic. And um, it's going to depend on the thickness of the plastic. And some plastics um, made with different, um, you know, materials. So it'll depend on the specific plastic. But a long time, right? It's going to hang out in our ocean for a long time. The point is we want to make sure it's, you know, our impact is reduced 
on the ocean. Okay, uh, how many animals do I see per day? It depends. Sometimes I'll see a bunch. Sometimes I'll see a bobcat run across here. Sometimes I'll see, you know, a heron just hanging out in here. Um, so I see quite a few animals a day. Um, and it, it really depends too on the weather and it depends also just other factors. Um, and someone asked too, how big do the waves get? And the waves here, you know, recently they have crashed over onto here, like where those palm trees are. You can see there's kind of like dirt right here. They'd crash onto there. These waves get big here, especially when we had our king tides. If you guys went to the beach, you saw that the tides were super high or when we have storm surge, waves here can get pretty big. Usually they stay kind of, you know, smaller, tamer. Um, we have a lot of surfers that come here, but the waves aren't super crazy here, typically. Oh, someone likes my jellyfish earrings. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, other animals eating mermaid purses. So when I did some research about mermaid purses, um, I saw that other sharks might eat mermaid purses. Um, I think other animals, you know, that's why they kind of try to hide it within the kelp because on that picture I showed you guys, you know, kelp, especially when it's in a big, you know, mess of it, it's kind of hard to pick a certain thing out of it. And also my hold fast fell down here, but on that hold fast I showed you guys earlier, there is a mermaid purse within it. So in that root structure. So they try to hide it. They try their best to hide it. Um, but if it's not hidden well, then it might be eaten by, you know, maybe a fish that's large enough to eat it, maybe another shark, things like that. Um, why do so many animals What was it? Um, why do so many animals depend on, kelp? depend on kelp? Why do animals, so many animals depend on kelp? So I like to think of it as like the rainforest forest, right? So we have a bunch of animals relying on those trees um, for a source of food. Maybe there's, you know, um, some shrubbery or other trees growing within there that give them food, like fruits and stuff like that. Um, could give them habitat. It could give them places to hide. Um, so all of these animals are really utilizing these big, massive forests that are under the water um, to give them shelter, food, um, safety, all of that stuff. So it's just a, a nice safe haven for animals. It's also a nice hunting ground for animals. So where does kelp come from and how is it created? Ooh, where does kelp come from? How is it created? So kelp is going to establish itself in a part of the ocean that has a lot of nutrients and also a lot of light. So it has to establish itself. And the first thing it needs is a rock. It needs something to hold itself onto, something to put its hold fast on. And, you know, it's not necessarily a plant because it's not, you know, um, complex in the way it needs xylem and a phloem and all of that stuff. All it needs is light and it will just uh, multiply its cells until it grows bigger. Um, so our kelp um, grows like that and it just needs more light and more nutrients like nitrates, um, stuff like that that are coming up from depth. Um, how long does kelp live? How long does kelp live? So it depends on um, the species of kelp, but uh, kelp can get to 150 feet and grows two feet per day, somewhere within that range of months to maybe smaller, depends on their ocean um, processes too, if it's stormy, stuff like that. Is kelp a plant or an animal? Kelp is a, not a plant nor an animal, it's a protist. <laughs> uh, let's see, what is one of the most biologically diverse parts of the ocean? What is the most biologically diverse parts of the ocean? I love this question. So usually we think of like, you know, oceans people want to go to, right? We think of Caribbean, I want to go there. It's all crystal clear and blue, right? I told you about that. Um, and, you know, on other parts around that, there's not a bunch of life. Life in like those type of tropical areas are kind of in just the coral reefs. Here there's life all over because there's, you know, our kelp forest, and then there's nutrients that are kind of flying all over the place. Um, so kelp forests arguably are the, the most biologically diverse and highest biomass um, within the ocean. 
my least favorite sea animal. I mean, I don't live near the Antarctic, but a leopard seal. I find those guys scary. Uh, so a couple questions about sea animals. Uh, so why do you think sea urchins become invasive? Ooh. So why do sea urchins become um, an invasive species, or why do they become such a harmful species? Um, and that is from finding out that there needs to be a balance. So um, our sea otters are what we call a keystone species. And there's other keystone species in the ocean. And we found out the hard way that they're a keystone species because we found out with their absence that sea or sea urchins just go crazy. Um, and so they are such a harmful species in our kelp forests because um, when they go unchecked, they can reproduce quickly and um, be really destructive to that um, kelp, especially younger kelp that's not super well established yet. Uh, so like how can a shark make that purse? Ooh, so the question was how can a shark make this mermaid purse? So I believe this mermaid purse is made out of similar material. Um, it is made out of similar material as like our hair and our fingernails, like keratin. So it's super strong protein that is made out of this. Um, and it comes out of the mother and, um, you know, I, I tried to understand why this one came out spiral shape as compared to this one. And that's going to be based off of, um, you know, where they're laying these. This one will just be on kelp. This one will be on kelp and kind of shoved into, you know, maybe a rocky crevice as well. Um, and this uh, horn shark one, Sergi, it was under the water and the kelp was moving back and forth. This one will kind of anchor better into place. But how it's made is going to be based off of, um, you know, keratin, similar stuff from our hair and um, from the mother. Why is it called? Because it looks like, why is it called a mermaid purse? Because it kind of looks like a cute little purse. If I was a mermaid, put my cute little stuff in here. And kelp bleach like coral. Coral, yeah. So I think here is like our coralline algae. And it is algae, um, but you can see this one kind of bleached like coral. Um, coralline algae uh, is true algae. It's a little different than regular algae, but it does bleach like this, but yeah. Ooh, do all sharks make mermaid purses? So only about 43% of sharks skates and rays, like stingrays, make mermaid purses. Um, other animals like the macro shark, the blue shark, the bull sharks will do live birth, um, but other ones will just use egg casings. Um, do you know uh, approximately what the mermaid purse uh, survives using the full growth of mermaid purse? Ooh, what percentage of sharks survive to full growth in mermaid purse? I don't know the exact percentage, um, but typically in the ocean, there's, um, large clutch sizes, so a bunch of eggs at once, or in terms of this animal, they'll do this frequently, about 10 to 14 days at a time, um, in hopes that they will have um, success with some of their offspring. Um, that's typically a thing that happens in the ocean is to you know, produce a lot, because um, it's really dangerous out in the ocean for little things. One other question here, what is one of the coolest things what is one of the coolest things I've seen in the ocean? Um, it was probably another time when I was scuba diving. Um, it's very similar to my sea lion experience, except for it was a little scarier because all I saw was this gray blob swimming towards me. I thought it was a shark. I could have sworn it was a shark and I got a little nervous, but really it was just a harbor seal. So a cute little seal that poked its head out. And you can see this guy's different from our sea lion because instead of having ear flaps, he's got ear holes. And it's kind of got a smushed in snout um, as opposed to the sea lion has that longer snout. And this guy's a little bit more round because the sea lion's a little bit more slender. So that was a cool experience. All right, so we don't have any other questions, but thank you guys so much. Oh, I see one last question came in. Where do harbor seals live? And they'll live in the kelp forest. They'll also um, come up on shore. Um, they like areas where there's kelp and sand. Um, that's usually their hangout spots. But thank you guys so much. I had an absolutely amazing time talking with you about our MPAs, about our kelp, um, how it's playing a role 
in our lives every day, like when we brush our teeth and eat our ice cream, and also how it's helping um, keep our ocean happy and keep all of the animals that are relying on it happy. Um, and also, I love telling you guys about some things we can do, right? Three for the sea, don't forget it. And you guys are the solution to pollution. Everything you do, big or small, has um, major impact. It makes waves. So, yeah, I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye.